Well, uh, Pastor Darren, uh, as I just said, has taken off, and so I'm uh, filling in for him this morning as we continue to look at the book of Ephesians. Now, many of you know uh, we've been looking at the book of Ephesians for how many weeks? I don't remember either. A lot, right? A long time. Um, if you've been here every week, you know that we've been in this book for seemingly uh, weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and really, it's, it's, it's a great thing. We're, we're digging into the, the word, really understanding it, really understanding all the things that Paul has for us in this letter to understand uh, about it. And so uh, it, it's been really great to dig into that. We're going to continue that uh, today. But before we do, I want to ask you a question uh, this morning. Have you ever had this experience where you, maybe you received a gift? or you went on a trip or, or some kind of uh, event or adventure, and when you got there or when you, when you received it, um, once you got it open, like it was, it was bigger than you thought it was going to be. It was more significant. It was, it was greater. It was somehow richer, and, and it just really surprised you uh, by how much more was there than what you had initially anticipated. Uh, have you experienced that? Um, it, it's happened to me. It happened to me in this job, um, uh, taking this uh, role as family pastor. I, I never could have imagined all the things that God would have for me to do and, and um, all the things that he would let me do and all the, the wonderful things I get to be a part of in this role, I'm so thankful for it. But I think more often than not, it happens to us in more of the negative context, more of the negative way. At least that's been my experience. In fact, that happened to me uh, just yesterday um, as I thought that I had a very simple task to do, a very simple job to perform, and it turned out to be uh, something much, much bigger. Um, what happened is on Friday, my wife had picked up a, a nail or a screw in her tire. And so the tire had gone flat. Um, we were thankful she had made it home before the tire went flat. And so it was in the driveway. It wasn't a big deal. We didn't have to go find the car or get it towed. And, and really, it should have been just a simple little job. 15 minutes out there, you know, jack up the car, take the tire off, plug the, the, the hole there, and then um, and put it right back on. Shouldn't have been a big deal at all, except that I forgot that I should never work on cars. <clears throat> And I mean, never should I work on cars. I should be banned from that activity. So I get out there and I get the car, uh, I get the lug nuts loosened, I get the car jacked up, and I'm, I'm removing the tire from the wheel well. And as I'm removing the tire from the wheel well, I realize that I have forgotten a crucial step in this process. And that crucial step is to set the emergency brake. And the reason I realize that is because as I pull the tire off, the car slips off the jack. Now, as you can see, I'm fine. I got all my fingers. My toes are still there. We're okay. Okay, nobody got hurt. Praise the Lord. And the car landed on the tire, so the damage is somewhat minimal. But it did take a 15-minute job and turn it into an hour and a half job. I had to get my buddy to come help me get the car up. And, and we had to, you know, figure out, can we reshape the tire? Is the tire now ruined? What's going on here? All these things. And now it's leaking a fluid of an unknown substance, um, which will be taken care of at a later date. So as I said, something that was supposed to be really simple turned into this really huge thing. And what makes matters worse is it's not the first time it's happened to me. <laughs> That's a different story. Anyway, my point is this, that, that oftentimes, right, we go into a situation or experience thinking that we have it all figured out. We know exactly what this is. We know the parameters of it. And then all of a sudden, we're surprised by how big the thing is, by how amazing it is, how, by how much more there is to it. And as I was studying this passage of Ephesians, what struck me is Paul's excitement about how much more there is to our faith than what we first anticipate, more, more than what we typically see on the surface, how much deeper this thing goes, how much more there is. It's really, really, um, I, I was just fascinated by it. Um, and so we're going to look at this passage today. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can turn to there. Uh, we'll put this text up on the screen as well. Um, Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse 7, but I want to back up just a little bit before we uh, jump right into that text. Um, if you've been following along with us, you know that we've been in Ephesians for a long time, uh, reading through this letter, um, and you'll know that Paul is the one who wrote this letter. And, and Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles, non-Jewish people um, in his day. He planted a lot of churches. Um, sometimes he got in trouble, got put in prison a few times, and he wrote letters to those churches to uh, encourage them, to uh, build them up, to teach them, to train them. And this is one of the letters that he wrote uh, to encourage courage, to train, to equip, and to um, let them see how their lives in Christ should look different than their lives before Christ looked. And that's really the whole point of the letter is this is what God has done for you. This, these are the implications of that. Now, Paul... <clears throat> 
has written, uh, he wrote most of the New Testament. Most of the letters that you find in the New Testament written by Paul uh, wrote a lot of things. Um, Paul is uh, a well-known author in the scriptures. And Paul um, has this tendency about him uh, to kind of get distracted. Like he'll, he'll be talking about something and all of a sudden he gets really excited about something and he just kind of goes off on these tangents. And so sometimes it can be really hard to follow Paul because he's just kind of all over the map. Now, personally, I find it refreshing that I'm not the only person that does that. Uh, so I really enjoy seeing Paul jump all over the place and get really excited. But that's what's happened in this section is in, in Ephesians 3 chapter 1 or verse 1 um, he gets uh, he's about to pray Paul's about to pray for the Ephesians and then it's like something distracted him we looked at that last week with Pastor Darren uh, and so you can go back if you missed that you can go back to our website and you can listen to that online uh, and kind of get catch the first part of this little tangent uh, and Darren walked us through the first part of that but today we're going to pick up halfway through that and pick up kind of the second part uh, of Paul's little tangent here and so that's where we are in the letter that's what's going on here uh, so just so you kind of have a have a a framework now for what's going to happen. And this section of the letter is actually a little bit, um, I found it confusing the first time I read it. So we're going to read through the entire thing, verse 7 all the way through verse 12, and then we're going to come back and kind of break these things down a little bit. So here we go, Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Now, I don't know about you, but the first time I read that, I went, Paul, what are you talking about? Manifold wisdom, mysteries hidden for the ages. What, is, what are you talking about, Paul? So we're going we're gonna to take a step back. We're going to slow down. We're going to break this down, and hopefully we're going to see why Paul got so excited and why he was on this tangent. So coming back to verse 7, uh, I've highlighted a few words in here that I think will help us understand kind of the purpose and the meaning behind each of these different sections. So starting in verse 7, here's what Paul says. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, the first thing that stands out in this section, what, like, what really hits me about this it is the, the humility that Paul has, the thankfulness that he has, the graciousness that Paul has about this. I mean, the, he uses the word grace two times. He talks about being the least of all the saints. Paul is really like overwhelmingly um, thankful and gracious and humble that he gets to do this thing. And what's really interesting is this thing that he gets to do, being the minister to the Gentiles, being the one to share the good news with them, is what landed him in prison. Like, the fact that I got to do this is why I'm in prison in the first place, but I'm so thankful that God showed this unbelievable grace to me, that he let me do this thing, that he let me be a part of, of what he was doing and, and being a part of this mission to the Gentiles. Paul is overwhelmingly humble and gracious, and I think that there's something we can take away from that, and it's this, that we should exhibit a humility that comes from the grace we have received. We should exhibit a humility that comes from the grace we have received, like Paul did. Now, if we know Paul's story, it becomes a little easier to understand why Paul was so gracious and thankful. See, what you may not realize is that Paul wasn't always called Paul. A long time ago, his name was Saul. And as Saul, the first time we see him show up in Scripture is in the book of Acts. And he shows up not in a real positive way. In fact, Saul shows up at the stoning of a man named Stephen. He was there overseeing, watching this thing take place. A, a young leader in the church named Stephen was being stoned for proclaiming the truth about Jesus, and Saul was there giving approval of this event. And Saul would go on to persecute Christians uh, around the known world at that time. He would, he would go after all of these guys who, who professed Jesus, who professed Christ, and he was murdering them. He was killing them. He was trying to stop this thing called the church at any cost until Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. 
and on that road. And you can read this story in Acts. It's a wonderful story of how Jesus intercepted Paul and got a hold of his life and turned his life around. And Paul now became this amazing minister uh, who, who preached the gospel everywhere that he went. But Paul had this past, this history He knew what he had been saved from. He knew what he had been taken out of. He knew how wrong he was. Paul understood how broken and messed up his life was. And and I'm saying that we should have the same kind of humility because Paul understood something else that I think sometimes we miss. See, what Paul knew was this, that it didn't matter how great his sin was. That what had been revealed to Paul was this, that it didn't matter that his sin was really big or his sin was really small because what Paul understood is what James tells us in chapter 2, verse 10, this, that whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of breaking it all. See, in the kingdom of heaven, There is no class one felony and class three felony. If you break one part of the law, no matter what part it is, you are guilty of breaking the entire law. Paul got it. See, we don't don't tend to understand this fully. This This is what we think. This is what we think about sin typically. We think that this pot represents our life, right? That, that, I mean, just stay with me. I realize, like, nobody in here is a pot, Okay. (laughs) Stay with me. We think that this, this represents our life. And what we think happens is that when we sin, when we, when we mess up, when we break God's law, what we think happens is that our life somehow gets marked. Like it's, it's dirty. Like there's a stain put on us, right? So like this is, this is the little white lie that I told that was deceitful. Like it's just a little tiny mark, right? Because it's a little white lie, right? This is, this is the, that one time when I did that one thing that was pretty bad. Like I stole something that was probably not good. That's that thing there, right? This was that thing that, that I did that, that almost got me put in jail, right? That really, like, that was a pretty significant thing. Like, like, this is what we think happens, right? We think that we have these different sins, that there's di- different classes of sins, and that they mark up our life, and that somehow the, the role of Jesus is to, is to wash those things away, is to clean those things off. But see, Paul understood that it didn't work that way. Paul understood something different, something much, much more significant was happening in our sin. See, Paul understood that when we sin, it doesn't mark up our lives. It shatters them. Al, Al, I know you're here. I saw you come in. Al, I just want to apologize to you before I do this. Um, You don't know Al. Al comes in and spends hours every single week cleaning this room, making sure that it's ready for us so we have a nice, beautiful, clean space on Sundays. And so Al, I'm so sorry, but the truth about sin is that it doesn't mark up our lives. It crushes them. It destroys them. Paul understood this. That his life wasn't marked by sin, but that his relationship with God was destroyed because of his sin. That his life was completely broken because of his sin. And it's this brokenness, when we understand this, when we understand that we are broken because of our sin, when we understand that that my little sins have broken me just as much as this person's big sins. That that the things that I did a long, long, long time ago have broken me just as much as the things that this person did last week. When we understand that in God's kingdom, in God's law, under God's rule, we are all broken. See, when we get that, the arrogance that we sometimes have about being right just slips away. Because we remember that we were broken. We remember how bad we were. We remember how terrible our lives have gotten without Christ. And it's a great equalizer and it brings humility. And, and, And what we tend to think is this, right? What we tend to think, see, this is why Paul got excited. So because, because what we tend to think is that Jesus came, so we get it, okay? Let's say we get that our sin breaks us like this. So, so we get that and we go, yeah, yeah, I'm broken. Like, I'm completely broken. I need, I need Jesus. Absolutely, I need Jesus. And so we think that what's happened is Jesus has come somehow to take these pieces and like put them back together and glue it back together in such a way that it will pass, right? That it's good enough to get past the judgment, right? We think that Jesus came to say, hey, hey, you're so super messed up and broken, but here's your get out of jail free card. Like, I'm going to get you good enough to get by. That's what we think has happened. 
But Paul knows that there's a much bigger thing happening. And here's what he says in the next section. In in verse 9, he picks up and he says that his job, that his mission is to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, what Paul knew is that there's a purpose found in the church that goes beyond personal salvation. That there's a meaning here that is bigger than just God got me out of hell. There's a meaning here that's bigger than just God put my life back together. There's a purpose that is bigger than that. That's what Paul is saying in this section, that there's a bigger purpose. It goes beyond personal salvation. Now, I I don't want to diminish personal salvation. We just sang about how God has an overwhelming reckless love for us, that that he leaves the 99 to come and find the one that is lost. But here's what I got to get through your heads, that he didn't come to find the one that was lost to hand them a get out of jail free card. He came to find the one that was lost and invite them into something bigger, something bigger than you could possibly imagine. And Paul gives us a clue as to what that is earlier in this book, in Ephesians chapter 1, if we go back to verse 7 uh, in chapter 1, what Paul says is that in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. That's, that's the personal part. We have redemption. In the, in, through his blood, we have redemption. We have forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace. We've been brought in. But here's what he says. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. What is the ultimate purpose here? What is the mystery that's been revealed? It's this, to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. It's bigger than we think. And the reason that we don't get it is because we forget the story that we're in. See, we get caught up in our own story, in our own lives, and we think the story started when I was born. Like my story started October 20th, 1979, when I was born. That, that's what we tend to think. Or, or maybe we think that it started when our parents decided to have a kid, right? Maybe, maybe that's when my story started. Or, or maybe it started with Jesus, right? That's, this is the New Testament, the new promise has come, and so maybe it started with Jesus. But what we forget, what we don't realize is that this story started all the way back at the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, God made the heavens and the earth And they were perfect, and they were very good. And the reason that he created these things was to display his glory and the crowning jewel, humans who bear his image, who who reflect the glory of God fully. These people that would know God, that would have relationship with him, that would have relationship with one another, that would have perfect relationship with the world, with the earth. But before this, before sin entered, did you know we had this amazing relationship with the earth where we didn't have to till the ground, we didn't have to work, it just produced for us? We had this amazing, perfect relationship. And before sin entered the world, we had a perfect relationship with God where we knew him, where we would walk with him, where he would come and walk with Adam in the garden and he would call out to them, Adam, I'm here. And Adam would come running, not not out of shame, not trying to hide, not because he thought God was gonna punish him if he didn't get there fast enough, but Adam would come running to God because it was like running to his dad. My son Wesley is six years old. And I cannot walk in the house without practically being tackled by that boy. I'm his dad. He can't wait to have a hug from his dad. This is the relationship that Adam had with God before sin entered the world. Can you imagine the relationship that he had with Eve, his wife? Before sin into the world, before there was selfishness, before there was brokenness, before it was my way, before I had wounds that were, that were affecting my relationship, before all that happened in perfect unity. Can you imagine what that marriage would be like? Oh, man. Can you imagine? That's the story as it started, this perfect world that reflected God's glory. But as any narrative goes, there's a... There's an ideal world. There's something out there that is, that is set. There's a background. 
and then something happens and it causes things to go off course. All the great stories follow this, by the way. Something goes off course, it goes awry, and then somewhere along the path, a hero enters in that will set the story, set the narrative back on its original path and back to what was right and back to what should have been. Isn't that how the great stories go? I mean, think about the great stories. Think about, think about the epic tales of our time. Lord of the Rings follows this path. Saving Private Ryan follows this path. Like all of these great movies follow this narrative. Do you know why? Because it's the narrative that we live in. It is our story. Sin entered the world and broke our relationship with God, broke our relationship with each other, and broke our relationship with the world. And when Jesus came, he didn't come to put you back together so that you could pass. That's not why he came. He, yes, he has called after you. Yes, he has pursued you. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he wants to fix the things in your life that are broken. But he called you into something that is so much bigger. He is renewing all things. All things are being united in Christ. And here's what that means. It means that our lives don't look like these broken things put back together. What they look like is that God has taken our brokenness and set it inside of Christ. That he's taken the pieces of our broken life in Christ and he's set them in Christ. And so what we have now is not a, a, a broken pot that's been put back together, but a brand new life. Made new. In Christ, we've been made new. It's so much bigger than we could have imagined, it's so much better than we could have imagined. And in this newness, there's unity. Because here's my brokenness in Christ. And, and here's, here's that thing that you did that was broken. In Christ, and here's that thing that Pastor Darren did that's broken in Christ, and here's the thing that the elder did that's broken in Christ, and, and, and all of it is found in Christ and absorbed in Christ, and so we find that there is a great equalizer. In Christ, there is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave nor free. There is no longer male nor female. In Christ, there is no black and white or red or yellow or brown or tan. That Those things go away because we are found newness in Christ. See, what happens is Christ died once and for all. And when we accept that by faith, we are buried with him. Do you, do you know what happens when we baptize somebody here? We put them under the water and we say, buried with Christ and raised to new life. And you guys, if you've been around a long time or any length of time that you've seen a baptism, you know that we say goodbye to the person when they're being baptized. Why? Because they are being buried with Christ and they come out with a new life, not a fixed life, a new life. We've been united with him and made new. And what the church is proclaiming to the demons and the angels and the powers and the principalities in the heavenly realms across the universe, what the church is proclaiming is that the renewal of all things has begun. They were there. The angels and demons were there when the story was perfect. They remember what it was like to watch Adam display God's glory in the garden in perfection. They remember the relationship between him and Eve before, before sin broke it. They were there and they saw it fall and be destroyed. They saw it fall apart. They saw it be crushed. And now, the church, through the unity that we find in Christ, is proclaiming the renewal of all things, it's so much bigger than we thought. And we've been invited to be a part of it. And there's an implication here that Paul gets really excited about. In the very last verse, in verse 12 of this section of scripture, here's what Paul says. In whom, in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. See, the renewal of all things brings with it unity and access. 
The renewal of all things means that I don't come to God as a broken piece of pottery going, man, I hope that he's not going to lose it on me this time. Man, I hope that I'm still forgiven. I hope that I'm still good. I hope that somehow I can still get by. I'm not coming to him with that timidness and that that, that silliness that says I I, I can't be accepted because of what's happened to me in my past. I'm coming, founding, being made new in Christ. I now have boldness and confidence to come before the throne of God as if it's my father, as it was with Adam and cry and God in that moment when they walk together as father and son do you get it we have access to God it's unbelievable it's unthinkable that the God of the universe would not only allow us to come into the throne room but would call us like little children As we were worshiping just a minute ago, I was praying for you and I was praying about this message that God would speak clearly and and, and what God gave me this picture was. And so somebody needs to know this. Somebody needs to see this picture today. I don't know who it is, but you need to see this. God is not like your earthly father was. He's not sitting in his easy chair watching TV and and putting up with the annoyance that is you. That's That's not the father that we have. He's not the father that's so consumed with his work in the world, with what he's doing, that he doesn't have time for you, that he doesn't have time to care about you. That's not the father that we have. It's not the father that says, you have to be good enough to come to me. It's not the father that says, it better be perfect or it's not enough for me. That's not the father that we have. We have a perfect father who says, my son, tell me about it. I'm so excited to see you. Yes, yes, I would love to go play with you. I would love to hang out with you. I would love to go on a hike with you. I would love to be in your life. I would love to speak with you. Yes, I will come help you fix your car. I will be with you in that. I will walk with you. We have access with boldness and confidence. But we don't act like it. So often, we treat God as the distant father. Like we're afraid to come to him, like we're afraid to walk with him. Or, or we think that's only for the elite, that's only for Paul and, and the pastors and maybe the elders and a few select church leaders. No, no, what happens is we are unified. We find new life, unity in Christ. And if that is the case, then it means that there's no longer a distinction between pastor and non-pastor. There's no longer a distinction between elder and non-elder. What that means is that you have the same access to God that I do. And that he wants to speak to you the same way he speaks to me. And he wants to walk with you and be in your life. You have access, boldness, and confidence to come before the throne of God. So often we just brush it off. I mean, I hope you guys get the significance of this. The God of the universe who put all things together has called you son, has called you daughter, wants to be in a loving relationship with you as if you were his only child. He adores you and he has a purpose for your life by bringing you into his family he is proclaiming to the universe the mystery and the wisdom the manifold wisdom of God that is he is making all things new And when we recognize the story that we're in and the brokenness that we have and the fact that God has invited us into this place of course we're humble like Paul of course We're gracious like Paul, of course. We're thankful to be in prison, but proclaiming the gospel like Paul. Our lives have been made new 